your transit system would be the ticket the passenger pays to get on the bus plus the toll that the, the automobile user pays to make use of that managed lane. With that kind of toll box, we think you can actually create enough revenue to cover 100% of your operating costs on the transit side. Bus toll lanes, a public-public partnership, maximizing the expertise of each agency, producing the next generation of sustainable transportation systems. Next up for bus toll lanes, an analysis on a pilot location, as well as getting the legislative ability to apply for federal new start grants. Under today's rules, bus toll lanes qualify for a limited element of transit funding, an idea that will allow tolls and transit to work together to accomplish transportation goals. At the end of the day, regardless of a planning study, what you're after is something that can be implemented. Because to me, the ultimate winner is everyone that's out there going from home to work, to church, to the soccer fields, bringing in all the freight goods. It's mobility. These are opportunities of not just moving a car, but it's moving people, moving freight, moving goods, and probably last and most important, it's moving an economy. So that probably doesn't give you enough of what the idea is I'm talking about. So the next few slides I'm going to go through, I'm going to set the stage. I'm going to talk about what's the opportunity in my community, all right? I'm going to talk about what the various components are of transportation solutions, one that's applied by a typical highway agency, one that's applied by a typical transit agency, what those challenges are. And what you'll see as I walk through this is their strength and weaknesses almost complement each other when you put them together a different way. So in Tampa Bay region, what are you looking at? That is a map done by a regional planning uh, agency. And Hillsborough County basically is uh, a large square within that section. Let's see if this is working. If I had to describe Hillsborough County, it basically goes up like this, across like this, and back down. All right? It's about 1,000 square miles. Uh, what you see in the blue lines are managed lane concepts that the Florida Department of Transportation has under the planning studies. There's over 200 miles of managed lanes being considered in our community, okay? So that's the solution to how do I increase vehicle throughput today and make sure that's a sustainable choice in the future. If you don't know what price managed lanes are, you can ask me later and I'll walk through that. But really what you're doing is you're building a new lane and you're pulling it to control how many vehicles get in the lane so it always maintains a travel speed of 50 miles an hour. That's the idea, okay? So the potential here is Tolling in this instance has been repurposed. It's been repurposed to assure a certain level of service. Traditional tolling is intended to create a revenue stream from which you finance new work, all right? So right off the top, tolling has been repurposed to assure a level of service. The revenue stream is huge. If you look at our studies and others we've seen, if you just took a 60 to 70 mile section of those and you had it built and you did a forecast over 30 years, that system could easily generate $10 billion in revenue. So there's a huge opportunity, all right? So why do we build price managed lanes? Well, the answer's here in the first, in the top of this. If you go into a, a congested lane of highway, uh, what, the, what the top line there is showing you is in that congested lane of highway, you're moving about 1,100 vehicles per hour. When you apply the price management, you get more vehicle throughput, all right? Because you're moving them at 60 instead of at 40 or 20 miles an hour. So in that case, you're moving significantly more vehicles. So you do increase throughput of vehicles. But the real way to increase mobility is to start adding buses to the mix, all right, okay? Because you're going to be limited to the vehicle component at all times. It's just a function of how close you can follow and how many vehicles can fit in that lane. But when you start adding buses to the mix, and in our study, we ran buses in the peak hours running on 10 minute headways, you're actually able to up that by almost twice what is going to go on in the adjacent congested lane. And more importantly, as time goes forward, again, the capacity of that price managed lane doesn't change. The way you put more people through that lane, you keep adding more buses. And the neat thing about this kind of concept is, if you added buses to you had a bus a minute going through that lane, you would be using less than 10% of the managed lane capacity. So 90% of the capacity is still there, available to people driving a personal car if they need it that day, and they want to make that trip and they don't want to rely on the transit. So that's why you do price managed lanes, but this is why you also bring transit into the discussion. Okay, these are scary charts, but I'm going to try and help make sense of them for you. What's the tolling challenge? 
if you wanted to build Price Manage Lane, this is a very typical picture of what the tolling challenge would be. The pie up here is meant to represent your capital cost. Capital cost on a, on a theoretical network that we, we laid, laid out right here was um, about $740 million, okay? So I'm doing this as a toll agency. What I do is I say, okay, what's the traffic and revenue forecast over the next 30 years? And that's what the graph down here is showing you. It's showing you 30 years of, of, call, of revenue. That large green wedge growing up there represents about $2.5 billion, okay? Now what you see I have to lay on here to go after my financing is the bottom orange bars are my operation and maintenance costs. If I'm going to go to the bond market and say I want to issue some municipal bonds to do this construction, they want to make sure you can maintain the lanes and collect the tolls. So you have to take that cut off the top or off the bottom, so to speak. All right? So what you have left then is what you can go out for finance. Well, here's where the challenge comes in. When you apply traditional bonding constraints, such as debt coverage ratios, you can't get as much money out of that wedge as you think, all right? And it's primarily due to the early year of, of the flow, all right, as you're ramping up, okay? Because you're so low here, when you apply that debt coverage ratio, which is 1.5, what that means is the bond buyer wants to make sure that you've got 50% more revenue coming in in every year than you need to pay them, all right? Because they're your investor. They're the one who put the money up for you to build this. So that's a safety margin that's there. Well, that safety margin constrains how much you can actually pull in of that revenue stream. So in this picture, what the pie chart's now showing you is that bond toll can only, that bond, uh, can only cover 25% of the cost. The other 75% of the cost, I need somebody to come to the table with that money so that we can build this facility. Covering operation maintenance, not a problem. Bringing the, the capital into current year dollars, and building the asset, that's the challenge for toll. So what's the transit challenge? If you built this network, and you said, okay, transit, network's here, uh, everybody thinks it's a good idea, let's go out and start running premium express bus service on this network. Well, we looked at about a 55 mile network is what we're talking about here, and to buy the rolling stock to build parking lot lots to set up this express premium bus service on this network, it cost about $33 million. Not a big hurdle, not insignificant either. But the real challenge for transit rolls out when we providing the service over a 30-year horizon, okay? So if you look at the fare box, bus paid uh, ticket buying passengers, over 30 years that generates $70 million. However, the cost to operate, maintain the service, replace the buses on a 12-year cycle is close to $600 million. So you do the plus and minus, what you're looking for after you've gotten your grant to build, to buy the rolling stock, to build the port and ride lot is, you have to go look for a subsidy source to pay for that half billion dollar O&M over the next 30 years. And that usually means you need a tax referendum of some sort to do that. So those are the individual challenges that you see. One's strong on O&M, one's, one's challenged on O&M, one can access capital to buy the rolling stock, the other is looking for a friend to help them do the same. All right, so what we do in our concept, we throw it all in one bucket, all right? This is a transit concept. The lanes have become a fixed guideway. The rolling stock is the, the vehicles that run on the fixed guideway. The total cost is now $577 million because we've thrown it all in together, okay? And the idea is if transit comes to the table with capital, with equity investment, what they then have is an entitlement to the revenue that comes out of that investment, all right? In effect, they become the owner. And that's the benefit that they, that they would want to achieve from the highway side, your goal is to get the lanes built and provide that managed lane solution. So you can check that box off. That's going to happen if we can get this built as a transit granted project. Um, so in essence, we're inviting transit into the tolling businesses. Uh, and we want to provide transit with a competitive edge. If you can make sure the bus is giving the fastest trip, the most reliable service, at the lowest cost, that's how you get people out of the car into the bus. All right. So that's another benefit we're looking for. So I'm going to go to this chart. Now this is where it gets even more complicated, but it's basically the same chart you saw before, but now I'm adding some things to it. That pie to the left now says, we're approaching this as a new starts project under the Federal Transit Administration program. <coughs> and when you go that way, what you're doing is you're pursuing 50% of the funding would come through the FTA as a grant to your project, all right? That means state and local on any 
new storage project is typically has to come up with the other 50%. Something new in a transit solution now is, well, I've brought a new source of funds to the table for transit. I'm now able to cover 25% of the local match out of my toll volume that I talk about down here. All right? So in essence, I've lowered the bar to my state and local community to come up with the balance of this project to get it funded, to get it funded sooner and money. Well, what does transit get out of this deal? Why would transit be interested? Well, it does move people. Our study showed conclusively you add this kind of service in these lanes, you do move many more people. But what, what the real focus is they gain access to that revenue. What's that revenue do for? Them? All right. So in the chart we just talked about the bonds, you had the Pat said debt coverage ratio. At the end of every fiscal year, all right, once you pass your test, that revenue is, that's left over can be used for whatever the owner wants to use it for. In this case, what we've done is we've layered in the transit O&M costs. And what you see here is from year one, you're covering about 80% of the transit O&M cost. No transit service, well, I'll just say it this way. Typical, you're at 20 to 30% of your fare box covering your O&M service cost in transit. So this one starts out at about 80%, and within the fourth year, you're covering 100%. So that's a big deal for transit. I'm good out covering over half a billion dollars worth of operation maintenance costs over the next 30 years from this user fee based system, not from a tax based system. The revenues generated cover that cost. More critically, from my perspective, as a policy wonk, if you want to call me that, be called worse, uh, is this revenue up here, this excess revenue. Because the reason that bar, that, that chunk, gets so big in the out years is because congestion continues to grow. When you've applied your price managed lane, you basically said, that's the last improvement I can make in that quarter, all right? So I'm going to do something that is sustainable from a service perspective. And I'm using that price management to make sure it stays sustainable. So as congestion grows, what happens is the value of that choice continues to go up. So what you produce over time is revenue above and excessive cost. Well, from the policy side of an urban center, which is what I come from, which is what you live in, that now is a source of revenue to actually grow more transit service. You can go out and buy more buses, pay for more O&M out of that revenue without going back to the tax bill unnecessarily. Okay? So it gives you sustainable choices. It gives you a reliable bus service. It gives you the revenue to pay for the bus service and to grow the bus service as congestion grows in the, in the future. So it goes from not just moving vehicles, but to increasing mobility. And that's, that's the basic concept. So, Another look at the pie, you know, how the revenues get split up in this particular example. What you're seeing is, you know, there's about 2.5, 2.6 billion in that 30-year forecast, and it breaks down like this. Uh, transit put in about, in this particular case, it was like 500 million. What does transit see as a return for that? Um, well, I'm just talking about this much of the pie had to be eaten up to cover my financing cost for the bonds I sold. This much is covering the lane maintenance and operation, collecting tolls. That's your initial transit service you put in there. That's the O&M that's covered out of that revenue stream. And up here, what you got is new revenue that, uh, that your community can use to continue to grow transit in that core. And when you look at the numbers, that's like that 900 plus that, that 500 is about twice, over twice, what the, the capital investment was up front. So they get a nice you know, bang for the buck if you want to look at it that way in terms of the benefit. And this is, again, going back to the question of how the financing works. Again, talk about a new start. It's a 50-50 deal, whatever the size. Um, this one, just this is all theoretical. The bottom line is this is a new source of local match you didn't have before. What it does is it lowers the bar, makes the challenge at the local and state side easier for them to come up with the other 25% to have a fully funded capital project and move ahead. So kind of as a benchmark or a check on when we were doing this analysis, because you know, I told you at the very beginning, four years ago we had the idea, and we partnered with Hart. We saw people in the video who worked for our local transit agency. They partnered with us to pursue a grant through the Federal Highway Administration to do a proof of concept study. So I told my people, I said, if you're doing this, everything's going to be conservative. You will not leave any holes in this. You will not underestimate capital. You will not overestimate revenue. So it's a very conservative approach. And uh, in that network I just went through, which is an average of the three networks we did, 
you were looking at something like a 50 mile network to generate, uh, what was it, about two and a half billion dollars for the city The Florida DOT is, uh, wants to build 20 miles of express toll lanes in Orlando, a city about 40 miles away from Tampa. That would be two lanes of express toll lanes going each direction in that community. They're putting it out as a P3, a public-private partnership project. And it's because that pie chart I showed you, while it generates a lot of revenue, the shape of that revenue, I'm not. Houston, we seem to have a problem. There's one more slide here I want to get to, and our technical assistant gets there. So anyway, the, the point of, of this, if, if we get that slide to roll over, is, is that revenue picture. When I talked about my network that we did under analysis, we were talking about two and a half billion dollars. That's the Florida DOT forecast of revenue out of that 20 mile section that they're putting out for consumption by potential bidders on the project. And what you see is that ranges in the first 30 years alone from 3.9 billion to 4.9 billion dollars. All right, so I felt good. You know, we completed our study before DOT put this out for bids, so I was like, okay, my people were conservative, and part of the conservative was, in our study, we said, does this support transit-oriented development? That's one of the factors we looked at. And we made those kind of assumptions. We said, okay, if you structure it this way, you make the right decisions to develop TOD, what you actually do is you drive down your trip demand by 20%. So that's part of the reason why my revenue forecasts are low, because I said, well, we're going to do this in a framework for the transit-oriented development plan. So, you know, the worst case scenario in our, play, in our situation is you might end up with more money than you thought if the TOD development doesn't occur the way you want. But the bottom line is this kind of service will support transit-oriented development. So I was very happy to see that we were seem to be in a safe zone in terms of what the revenue is coming out of this kind of system that we generate. So I'm going to close now. Um, this is a mobility solution addresses moving vehicles and people. Um, it takes a very sound financial approach. It is not a hot lane concept. There is no HOV discount. All right? My world is a toll agency. I don't give HOV discounts. I have an asset. I have a value. I have a capacity in my road that I'm basically making use of. And if you want to use the road, it's your choice, but you'll pay for that use. And that's what I use to pay my investors back. And my investors are my bondholders. They gave me the money so I could build that road that you use today, and I need to meet their commitment. If I give HOV discounts, then I create a declining revenue balance over time, and that doesn't do anybody any good. And if you look at HOV versus trying to get people into the bus, if people want a carpool, that's great. The real cost of a vehicle, though, is in buying it, insuring it, putting gas in it, and parking it. If there happens to be an incidental toll along the way that you would like to save by carpooling with a friend, then go do it, okay? But if you want to really focus on the bus, create a sustainable revenue stream so that you can create an ad transit in a sustainable way, then you don't give away the asset because it's a very limited asset when you price it the way. So that's a, that's a key thing. Practice our business rules create a sustainable, ongoing business opportunity. Um, I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Can you um, explain to us uh, how your uh, financial structure and what your funding and bonding authority is, is structured in Florida? It's because we don't have the same sort of structure here. So when you talk about our money and our bonds, so who is the hour? You, 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 I think you do have the same opportunities and the same structures here. When but when you were talking about the bond that failed, yeah, whose when, bond was it? When you, this would be a bond that we as a toll agency. Okay, we don't have a toll agency. Two, two, two different things. One is the, the bond that failed was wasn't the what was it? The transit referendum. Is that what you're referring to? You're talking about bonds versus. I'm, well, I'm talking about sort of the whole financial structure that y'all have because it's a bit different than what we have. Okay. I think. You have a, a turnpike agency here that built the toll road out here. Right. Okay. So I believe they issued bonds on against the toll revenue to help pay for the building of that facility. That's exactly what this is okay. describing. That's so when you were exactly. saying when you were saying the transit authority, it's just it's the Turnpike authority. Well, so. what I'm presenting in this picture is the toll challenge. Because I was trying to get across this. I'm a toll guy, 
If I wanted to build those price managed lanes as a toll guy because they're a toll facility, this is the challenge I would face. Okay. All right. I would face the challenge of I can cover my O&M, I can issue some bonds, but I can't cover 70% of the cost of capital to build it. So it'll cost me $700 million to build this network today. I need someone to come to the table that money. In Florida, the DOT right now, they're in the same position. That 20 mile road that they'd like to build express toll lanes along over in Orlando, they've done the same math. It hits them the same way. So they go to the private sector. What the private sector does for you is they come in and they say, okay, We'll help you finance this. You, we'll, we'll go to extended term beyond what you can normally do under a uh, public financing. <coughs> go 30 to 40 years max. Your public, 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 private partnership agreements can go. I mean, yours is 80 years. 80, 75 years. Yeah. So what you do is they extend the term, all right, to make sure they can get their their cost covered. But in that case, what happens is, in that scenario, this revenue here gets absorbed as a cost of capital financing. So over that 30 to 40 years, you know, you will get the lane built. That is the toolbox that Florida DOT has to use. They'll get the lanes built. They'll get the operation <coughs> taken care of. The finance will go to the private sector, but that financing and cost of financing will absorb all that revenue for the next 30, 40 years at, at a minimum. The solution we're proposing is really simple in, in this sense. We're asking, the public sector you use your traditional sources, which are either you know, cost of capital, hence that 50% new starts grant from the federal government, you don't ever have to pay that back. So that means it's not making any demands on this revenue stream. And this source of financing is lower than a typical P3 project can get you because it's tax free debt. And it depends on how well your project's rated. So I don't know if I answered your question. And then the um, bond that failed. What was that? What? You opened up a presentation where we had a referendum. And it oh, okay. That wasn't a bond. Okay. That was the community wanted to get the question. We want to add more bus service. We want to do more roads, and we want to do more taxes. And bond. so it was a it was a referendum on an ad, on sales tax increase, and once that tax increase, it failed. Okay. So one second. And what y'all have in there for transit? Now? Your tax structure. I can't answer that. I, I, was tried there something in it before I tried to get my transit partner to come with me, but he had something else he had to do today. I just didn't know whether y'all had had something in it before for transit at all in your sales tax structure. I don't think so. I think it's primarily the ad norm. I don't think it, I don't know if they get a piece of the sales tax today. So they were getting some of that Oh, they're definitely getting a, a tax for it. Yeah, they have to. Any transit system needs that. Or you, you must have one. <laughs> or you don't have one as well. And it, it comes back to you can get grants to find a rolling stock and do the capital front end of it, but to run the service, because you can only cover 20 to 30 percent of your operation maintenance out of the fare box, yeah. that means, well, where's the other 70 percent come from? It's an ongoing expense that you cover from some sort of tax resource. So, so the turnpike has already sold bonds. In this them. case, I can sell bonds. I'm a regional toll agency, all right? My roadway is the green one right here. So I can sell the bonds. That part of what made me think of this is like, okay, we were, we were a little unique in that, you know, I'm a regional toll agency. I'm right here. I know how to do this. And I've got a local transit agency that's right here. I'm friends with them. I know them. i would had experience in running capital programs at Maryland DOT for 12 years. And in Maryland DOT, uh, Maryland DOT owns the Baltimore transit system. They pay a third. They pay a third. Yeah, they pay a third of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Association costs, capital and operating. Capital is not going to come further. Anyway, they pay a third of that cost as well. So every time a transit project came up, and I say to my, my capital programming box, uh, I'd come up with a project and I'd go upstairs to the finance people and I'd say, look at this really neat capital project transit wants to do. And they said, what's the O&M? All right. So because they've got to build that O&M into their forecast. Well, the O&M, frequently is not, would be a much, much bigger hurdle than the capital side. It's not unusual for your, your O&M on any, any transit cost to be double what your capital was over the year period. And it's because you had to replace and renew what you bought up front. <coughs>
I didn't get a clear picture as to whether the services that were being run in the port view was playing in the retail services or existing services that were routed, and what was the impact in terms of increasing ridership, what is the total trend of ridership in these lanes, and what is the travel time savings, or just simple statistics like that in terms of the impact. Uh, to my knowledge, these are existing transit systems that are using the express lanes. And they've expanded their networks and they're really the new transit systems um, that we create as a part of the TMD for that package. We, usually, we did on Springfield, we actually created the, the transit system, the local transit system called TAGS, which was picked up later. But in the case of the Delta, these are existing systems. As to the ridership, um, I gave you a ridership, I think, on the HUV3 plus transit usage. I don't know that I have a breakout strictly for transit. Um, someone could probably get it, but I, I don't have it here at this point. What was the track? He was also asking, I think it was the travel time savings. Was the other thing you I think the, the travel time savings is kind of the, the average is about 20 minutes, which is pretty substantial in that order. Mm -hmm. um, I had one other question for Wagner. Yeah. Um, I was the, you, the, the managed lanes, you said, as a throughput of about 1,800 vehicles per hour versus the non managed lanes, which were 11. Would that be a wonderful argument for totaling the whole thing? Um, for the first time you were able to go out and put tolls on an existing roadway, yeah. let me know. <laughs> <laughs> but so the idea is you're, you're building new capacity, you're not taking away anything anybody can have away. But if you can go on the existing lanes from the 100 to 800, you're also technically building new capacity. You are. And that's the neat part about the solution addressing both sides of the question. It provides you new capacity for vehicles. It's limited provision because it will never be more than what you price manage it at. And if you put it together the way we're talking about, it provides you an even greater opportunity to increase people with capacity and in a sustainable way. I agree. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wagner, um, you mentioned that this, um, these toll lanes, the bus toll lanes, can also promote transformative development. Okay, when you set up um, transit-oriented development, what you're really talking about is you're going to establish what I'll call a node of development. And around that node, you're going to encourage high-intensity use, all right? And what you usually do and what transit is really all about is typically transit doesn't cover its operating costs because it's being subsidized from other sources to enable you to make a much more intense use of existing resources. So around that, that node, that transit center, what you'll have is you'll have your 10-story office buildings, okay? And you'll build away from that. You'll go down to five-story office buildings, you go down to one unit, you know, dwellings for families, and you move out to less dense type use, less intensive type use. So transit-oriented development is saying, I'm going to focus my development so that if I have this suburb area over here, I want to encourage a more uh, intense use. I understand of that. that. My question is, what is the transit node with buses? I'm sorry. What do you mean by a transit node? Okay. I, I, I mean, are you saying an established set? Let's talk about site? it simply as a geographic location. If I have my city center, all right, and you probably have relatively large communities that might be five to ten miles away where everybody gets in their car every day and come in to work in the city center. Well, I'm talking about out here at this city, out here at this suburban location. You could start building that out as another uh, transit-oriented development site. So your focus is on allowing the kind of transportation access by adding more buses to that location. So basically, a bus station. That exactly right. Working? Well, I'm sorry. Maybe it was an easier question than I thought. <laughs> I thought. <laughs> yeah, you're setting up transit stations, and you're doing them on the basis of BRT premium transit service. Okay. Sorry. You mentioned as part of your funding, uh, FTA New Starts funding, is that right? Yes, sir. Do you, do you have that secured, or is that something you are seeking? In this right now, um, this kind of application qualifies under something FTA calls Small Starts Program. That limits you to a maximum project size of $250 million, maximum federal share of $75 million. That's a 30% if you look at the numbers. Um, so I'm working with my transit partner right now trying to identify a project that I can take with for the DOT and say, this is what we want to take up the FTA, the Transit Administration, as our first project. I hope it's under 250, you know? But even better would be um, under MAP 21, the latest Surface Transportation Authorization. 
at uh, some of the old guard uh, rail uh, providers changed the definition of fixed guideway. A very simple thing they said, fixed guideway must have exclusive transit use. So if you read that strictly, it says, well, because I'm, I may have my driveway and I'm charging these people to use it as a transit agency, but I'm still letting something other than transit use it, that we can qualify for new stars. So I'd like to get that change so that I can open the door bigger, get better federal participation, and go after bigger projects. So that's a goal. That's an objective I'm working with. You showed rising toll revenues. And it was something you said I was trying to understand. Were the toll revenues rising because you said it was going to get more congested? So you're raising the rates over time as it grows more congested? Or is it that you're getting more throughput as it gets more congested? No, the throughput is always fixed. That price managed lane, this is how it works. If you take a lane of highway, and access control, that means it doesn't have any red lights, stop signs, it means it's like a lane of freeway. Um, and you want it to run at 50 to 60 miles an hour, the most number of cars you can put in that and have it run in a reliable manner is in the range of 1,400 to 1,800 vehicles per hour. Any more vehicles, when you get closer to 1,800, the first time somebody changes the lane without thinking about it, first time somebody, somebody taps the brake light, you create that snake effect of backstream, you know, backflow congestion. If somebody, if you go up to 2,000 and somebody pickups, you go into total uh, uh, grid line. So your um, your managed lanes are not a speed relative to the general lanes. They no, yeah, yes, that, that's a, I think I'm going to make the assumption you're making what I think is a neat point, and I'm going to explain what my point is. Then you tell me wrong. What you're doing in a managed lane, you aren't pricing the value of the managed lane against what's going on in the general purpose lanes. You're controlling how many vehicles get into the managed lane by monitoring how many cars are in there. So you're really just trying to make sure that I don't know what's going over here, okay? Your, your technology is looking, I saw this many cars get in, you know I have a predictive model that knows how many cars typically are coming at me based on history, so my rate is going to start changing to make sure I can maintain that 60 mile an hour, 50 mile an hour level of service. So, you know, the capacity is always the same. And you're right, the reason the revenue goes up is because congestion goes up, and it's a market-driven